This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Paul Collier, who is a professor of uh, economics and public policy at Oxford University and the author of uh, many books. Um, most recently, this one uh, called The Future of Capitalism. But of course, I think uh, best known for this book right here, The Bottom Billion. And this one too, which is uh, Wars, Guns, and Votes. Not the only books that you've written, but um, three of the ones that, that I was able to uh, locate in my library. Uh, and so welcome, Paul. Thanks very much for having me on, Greg. Now, this latest book of yours is a bit of a departure because you've spent most of your career thinking about development, uh, the obstacles to development, policies that can uh, improve development. And, and this book is really uh, about... Um, it's about the West. It's about the developed uh, countries. And I think it's kind of like a, a creed occur, you know, sort of a comment on uh, some of the divisions and, and um, social problems that we've been experiencing, certainly in Britain and in the, the UK. Um, what motivated you to uh, sort of switch your focus um, to uh, the problems of, of, of Britain and the US? Yeah, and no, I was partly with, um, I didn't go in search of the problems the problems I've been working on for a long time um, came in search of me. Um, so um, some of the issues that I've been all too familiar with in poor countries started to surface um, at rituals, both yours and mine. Um, and, uh, and also I, I, mean, I have this, if you like, the lived experience of two different worlds. Um, so yeah, now I'm, yeah, in all honesty, pretty fancy. I live very well in uh, a lovely uh, in North Oxford, which is uh, considered essentially uh, the highest ratio of house prices to income in the whole of Britain. Um, uh, a lot of my neighbors are North Americans. It's such a lovely place to live. And if you could afford it, you, you can't be I, I was the last press professor to buy it by street and that was over 30 years ago. Uh, so I made a lot Sounds of money. Sounds like Berkeley. Just, <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's the same sort of story. Yeah. Um, uh, but I didn't start on it like that. And um, I started the line very differently. I, uh, I was born in Sheffield, Northern industrial city. And um, some of your readers might have seen the full, uh, the, the full multi, um, which was very popular, um, uh, about 20 years ago. It's a very funny, sad film. Uh, and that was definitely, it was about the destruction of a big industrial city. Um, Sheffield, Sheffield was America's Pittsburgh and it crashed. It totally crashed. The steel industry just closed pretty rapidly over a course of about three years. Uh, well, that was my relatives. Uh, by then I'd left Sheffield, but it was my home. All my relatives were there. I was the only member of my family to get to university. Both my parents left school when they were 12. And so I was the, the freak um, that uh, uh, magical things happened to me. I was in just the right place, just the right time. Um, uh, a good free school, um, uh, um, wham, uh, the, 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 uh, astonishing feat of getting as a student at Oxford and then up the ladder, I rose, um, with the usual progression. Um, meanwhile, um, my cousin was born on the same day as me in the same place. Um, in the same social class, um, if you open your little book, uh, the future of capitalism, you'll find right early on, there's a photograph of the two of us together when we were age four. And, um, I can still rem remember that photograph. Um, and then we were in, and very similar position. We both got to good, um, state provided free schools. Um, and then her life diverged from mine through random shocks, but it diverged very badly 
and very radically. And, uh, and I started to realize just how good luck versus bad luck, um, could then compound and roll down the generations. Uh, so she became a teenage mother, both her daughters became teenage mothers. And one of them stumbled into a complete nightmare. Um, and I'm bringing up, um, the two of the children that were born to there, they're, they're wonderful kids, but, um, but that was a searing experience, uh, both of the geographic divide of living in this hyper prosperous place of Oxford and seeing this catastrophe in my own town, but also, um, being on this rising ladder of educational, fancy education, and then off you go, um, up the escalator, um, versus all my relatives who, um, invested in manual skills, the, st the skills of steel workers and all their skills evaporated. The pride that they took in their work disappeared, the work disappeared. One of my relatives ended up learning a living cleaning toilets, you know, and so this astonishing divergence in my own life brought me around to realize that something needed to be done about that. And, and it wasn't that it was just happening to a few people. In both Britain and America, those divergences, the spatial divergence between booming metropolis and broken provincial towns and cities, and that divergence between uh, hyper-educated success with fancy skills on top versus um, manual skills that became worthless. And um, mm -hmm. that divide became true of our entire societies, America and Britain. And not just America or Britain, but especially America. So the Anglo-Saxon world got a very bad dose of social divergence. And this gap between kind of the metropolitan elites and the, um, the people, you know, you call the sans cool, right? The, the, the people yeah. who are, uh, in these left behind areas. I think you, you, you quoted someone as saying that, that the elites view themselves as uh, kind of dragging around a corpse, right? Which is the, the, yeah, the non-metropolitan areas. Yeah, and, I mean, and so these 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 divides. I mean, they they were they were, they don't they remind me a bit of some of the the tribal divisions that you refer to, or the ethnic divisions that you see in, in developing countries. You know, when I, I studied development economics, um, we used to talk about um, kind of um, how the urban areas would more or less exploit the rural areas uh, by demanding things from the state. And so whether it's subsidized food or whatever, but the rural areas would be uh, basically sucked dry. And if you wanted to succeed, you had to more or less move into the city. Now, th this is clearly a very different, very different dynamic, but it, it does uh, have some, some echoes uh, with the work that you've done in, in uh, the emerging markets where you don't have a unified uh, national identity. Absolutely. So the, uh, the, 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 the paper I'm writing at the moment is called the bottom voice societies. Um, and, uh, I've been, in a way I've been working on the bottom societies in poor countries, um, for many, many years where the bottom eyes spatially, as you just said, but also the bottom eyes in terms of, uh, tribal groups, uh, loyalties, uh, ethnic groups, so, uh, or racial divides, um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and now our own society is becoming lobotomized, um, into these divides between a, uh, uh, an outsider social class that lives in, in nowhere places and an insider class that, uh, is skilled and confident, doesn't see there's anything wrong and, um, and is, uh, confident of its own 
both intellectual superiority and uh, and moral superiority. Um, Marcus Sandel, who has written this very good book, um, very recent to the tyranny of merit, um, uh, which is which is very much um, the sort of more philosophical end of of, uh, of, of, of of the future of capitalism. And I was delighted, I don't know Michael, but I was delighted that he, um, my publisher sent it to him and he came up with a very powerful endorsement of the book, um, just out of the books, really very nice. Since I've well, you, you have some very interesting. You have some very interesting uh, things to say about identity, um, and uh, I wasn't planning on getting there just yet. But but it's it's fascinating um, how um, people's identities have have changed over time. And, and you you talk about a moment in history where we had a very strong national identity, particularly right after World War II. There was a common purpose, a common mission uh, that was shared by people, most of the folks in the UK and, and the US. Um, and and this this uh, this common purpose uh, disintegrated, and people's identity now is is based more on let's say their job or or their skills. Uh, so that when you know you ask someone who they are, what they do, um, they might say you know I'm a, I'm a lawyer or I'm a professor, rather than saying you know I'm an American or I'm I'm an Englishman. Um, and and this this echoes the the comments that you have about. Uh, the prerequisites for successful development, where without a sense of national identity, the provision of public goods is less likely to happen. Um, is is this breakdown in national identity um, what's driving kind of the 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 underinvestment in public goods that we see in in our countries? I think it's 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 rather the lower problems because um, I, I, I like to use the distinction now between. Um, nationalism and patriotism, um, and what we're talking about, because the nationalism sort of now become associated with aggression against another group, aggression against another country, um, and, and that's obviously always pretty ugly. Um, but patriotism um, uh, needn't be associated at all with aggression. It's it's associated with loyalty to a, a large community, the bigger, the community, the better, but the, in practice, the biggest, uh, connectivity of community we've managed to get, um, for people being mutually loyal, um, is, 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 an, is, an, is a nation. And why does that really, really matter? Um, uh, because, um, once people have sort of see themselves as, as a, as a we, um, with mutual respect and mutual obligations, and then they become willing to comply with the things that's necessary to help the, the we, the collectivity. And so they're prepared to sacrifice their own individual interests for, um, for the, for this common purpose, they, they want to get the good opinion of others in the community. And to get that good opinion, they actually have to put the, the, the community's interests above their own. And we've seen that play out, uh, with COVID. I mean, frankly, I mean, um, some societies have managed to, to rally together and say, yes, here's new common purpose. Um, let's get rid of COVID and another seven. I mean, in, in Europe, the most successful country during COVID was not Britain, and it was Denmark. And uh, Denmark is led by a, a, a very modest woman, single mother. And so when she says we, other Danes think, yeah, you know, you like us. Um, you're not getting out of the corporate jet, um, and, and uh, you're not beat to a fancy store or something. You're just one of those. And so she just said, look, um, we've all got responsibilities here. Now the COVID's around. Don't give your neighbor COVID. So if you're an old guy like me, um, 
stay out of the way of the young people so they can get on with their lives. And if you're a run, if you're a young person with children, don't kill granny, you know? And, mm-hmm. and so the Danes completely avoided the first wave of COVID. They completely avoided the second. They got caught with the first, the third wave over Christmas, and they've already got rid of it. So they have the, the lowest mortality from COVID in Europe. They also have the lowest economic hit because they were able to get on with their lives. So there wasn't a trade off. Let's save lives at the expense of the economy. And it was just, they managed to do both through that philosophy of we all have moral responsibilities to protect each other from catching COVID. And then I think of America um, when COVID hit. And uh, um, you will remember back, back to March and, uh, 2000. And my searing memory is in long queues outside gunshots. And it, and from afar, I mean, I used to live in Washington. Sorry, I don't know American Eastern world, but from afar, that sounded to me more like uh, shoot your neighbor than protect your neighbor. And mm-hmm. shoot your neighbor uh, isn't really that good a strategy uh, in avoiding COVID. And um, so, that was just, uh, you know, I apologize for the cheap dig, but um, that's the difference between a society that can come together rapidly around willing compliance and through a modest leader who's able to communicate widely to everybody if you trust it, uh, and a society um, not led by a particularly modest leader and not particularly trusted by everybody, not particularly say, we all need to protect each other from spreading COVID. Um, and, uh, well, the rest is history. So, um, well, a lot of, so, a lot of this just is now this importance of really compliance around, the, but around many, many issues without really compliance, well, states can't function. That, that discussion, um, is, uh, built around a model of, of signaling, right? Status signaling. And um, the metropolitan elites are, by shifting their source of identity to, to skill, um, it, it's a way for them to um, uh, acquire esteem in, in your argument. And, and so it's very important for them to uh, distance themselves from the, uh, the folks who don't have that esteem. And one way you argue is to um, dismiss patriotism, to, to put down the, the rest of the country. Uh, yeah. and, and I found it interesting that in the COVID conversation, there, there was quite a bit of um, signaling in that way, right? So the, 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 the urban elites, it made, they wanted, wanted everybody to know that, that they were um, uh, dismissive of the, the rest of the country. And then the rest of the country more or less doubled down on an entirely different attitude uh, in order to signal something else. So it seemed like people's attitudes towards COVID were really more about um, self-expression than about concern for the, uh, for the, for the, for the public good. I, I saw a wonderful snippet. Um, um, so I don't know how well known it is in America. Maybe it's famous across your society, but it's about um, uh, attitudes. Um, would you feel safe going to have a haircut? which seems a very mundane sort of thing and um, hard to see how, uh, uh, are you willing to go and have an air car would be very political. Um, but it suits perfectly, um, by a political allegiance. So, um, in this case, Republicans say, yeah, sure. And Democrats said, oh no, no. Um, so, um, uh, what was it? What on earth was going on there? Um, it was presumably Republicans um, following the advice of the president, um, you know, um, get off, you know, never mind all this, just reach leech or whatever, versus the uh, Democrats who were trying to virtue signal that no, 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 we're, we're desperately concerned to protect other people. Um, so, um, so, yes, I mean, it's extraordinary how very mundane aspects of life have now become 
contaminated by this, this, this lobotomy, um, and the virtue signaling of the, of the success. And right. I think and if we go you know, back you... to, to sort of 1950, it wouldn't have been like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the chief executive of a big company would have been proudly American and not ashamed to say so. Um, and wouldn't have said that in a way of, uh, uh, of an aggressive statement to get somewhere else. He'd have said it because, um, people who just fought a war together. Well, you also talk about how social democracy was sort of an ideal that was shared by a um, large chunk of the population, particularly in, in Europe and in the UK, and that, that ideal has, has, has disintegrated. Um, and, and I think you, you kind of pin, pin the blame, uh, if, if there's blame to be pinned, um, on, on economists in part. Um, you know, it, it's sort of a, it's okay as economists, we can bash economists, um, but, but also as on, on the lawyers for, for a very different, in a very different way. Um, how have, and, and, you know, when you discuss the economists, I think you're, 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 you're criticizing them for only reading half of Adam Smith. I mean, your, your discussions about social obligations and about signaling and, you know, it's really drawn from the other half of, of, of Adam Smith. So if I think you're, you're arguing for a more inclusive economics, one that thinks a little more broadly about the, the human condition, how is it that economists are, are to blame uh, for what's transpired and what's led us think, to this, this impasse? Yeah, yeah. I think we got a, um, a very crude version of human nature um, when we were formalizing economics, which we really did in the 1950s, into models. Um, we wanted some account of human motivation. And the fifties, 1950s was the peak period of a crude Darwinian account of evolution, the survival of the fittest. And economists sort of casual interpretation of that, and uh, was to say, well, the only, you know, we've evolved to be, uh, greedy, uh, selfish, and, uh, and lazy, um, and that's what we put in our models. We're greedy. The more we can have, the better. We're selfish. The only person we care about in those models is ourselves. And we're lazy. And work enters negatively in the utility function. Yeah. And that's it in the typical simple economic model. You know, that's what undergraduates uh, learn for many, many years. Um, and they're still embedded in all the fancy models. That's the sort of engine of the uh, human behavior, really lazy selfish. Um, it's, and, and we're all a bit greedy and all a bit lazy and all a bit selfish because we're mammals and mammals have evolved, uh, to be greedy, lazy and selfish. But we now know from modern evolutionary biology that we're a very, very very unusual mammal, um, right? but the, 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 the giants of modern evolutionary biology and, and uh, Joe Heinrich, head of the department at Harvard, uh, Nicholas Christakis, head of the department at Yale, um, they both take the trouble of producing readable books, which even the economists can manage, um, which tells you a very different story. It tells you that this really lazy, selfish account of human nature is a complete travesty. It's not a bad account of most other mammals. You know, I've got a cat and I look at my cat, Grisou, and actually she really does exemplify economic man. And she's really greedy and she's very selfish. You should see her with the other cat and dog. And and she's in extraordinarily lazy. And <laughs> so I think we've got a, as economists, we've got a very good account of Catus economicus. Uh, but we haven't got an adequate account of human beings, except in a few very limited contexts. So 
The models are not totally useless, but they're only safe in very narrowly defined contexts where the greedy lady selfish is good enough. And the trouble is, we've applied those models all over the place. It's such an imperialist subject economics that we've applied those models to a vast range. You Gary Becker applied them to the family of all different things. Huh? Greedy, lazy, selfish. I mean, no, no, I'm sorry. I mean, um, that might be true of one or two families, but it's, but it's not true of most. It's, it's, it's not what's going on within a family. Families, like many, I mean, what does what Christakis uh, and Heimann tell us? They tell us that humans are very unusual. We've evolved to bond into big groups and value the good opinion of others in the group. And that good opinion doesn't necessarily reduce to a struggle over status. It can be a mutual thing. We can have mutual respect. It can be a threshold level. Here's the behavior that is, um, as long as you're over that threshold of behavior, everybody in the group can respect everybody else. Here's what we're trying to achieve, some common purpose. In order to achieve that common purpose, here's the action we need to do. And those of us do that action, we're over the threshold. We've earned the respect of the community. And being able to do, do that at grand scale is at its best what a patriotic society does. And that's, a, that's what America in the post-war era managed to do. There's a marvelous book come out um, uh, since the future of capitalism uh, by Robert Putnam called The Upswing. I don't know if you've had Robert on, the, on your program yet, but he's, uh, he Not just you know, he exemplifies that, that story. The upswing is this, this surge of uh, willingness to put the interest of the community ahead of the individual. So that was the catastrophe in economics, getting seduced by a completely Mickey Mouse version um, of, of human behavior. The renewal of the law in this next. Well, you you talk about uh, the you know ra how rational economic man should be redescribed as a rational social woman, and and I found that you know provocative. Um, but the the other point that you make is that uh, the 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 problem is not just that economists have a faulty um, model for describing and understanding humans, but that by creating policies that were built on this descriptive model, uh, they they've they've essentially changed people to become more like what the model describes them as. In other words, it's become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and so I'm, I'm wondering about that because, you, yeah. you know, Marxism had a faulty understanding of human behavior that we were all going to become selfless and it, it, it didn't seem to change people one bit. So, so why is it that this, this uh, positive model has had an impact on, on people and kind of yeah, destroyed or, so, I'm going to ask this. There's two answers to it. Think this. One is um, it subtly changes people's norms. And so we know, unfortunately, that students who learn economics gradually become more selfish. And why? I assume because. They're gradually learning, oh, that's what we need by uh, being rational. Um, to be rational is uh, to behave like this. And um, uh, I remember, I used to have a chair at Harvard, and I remember a, a story of a, a two young guys in the, in the common room, and um, uh, um, and there was, a com there was a communal pot of coffee and whoever emptied the pot was supposed to fill it up. And one young guy had caught the other having taken the last cup of coffee without having filled it up. And so the, the second young guy pointed out this 
uh, moral failing to the first young guy. And the first young guy looked a bit sheepish for a moment, but then said, oh, but, but it wasn't in my self-interest. And they both said, no, oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. This is, this is that, <laughs> that exonerated the behavior. And so that's part of the answer, that we actively changed the norms. Uh, that was most pronounced, unfortunately, in business where, you know, with Milton's, Milton Friedman's dictum um, that the, the sole purpose of the firm was to, to maximize profits, um, which um, had some rationale and efficiency on a set of assumptions which had never held anywhere in the real world, um, but that was all part of the assumptions that were uh, built into the model. Um, but that yeah, then got absorbed into business and taught and through by about the 1990s that first vintage of re-educated and, and uh, MBAs were, were rising high in companies and so companies literally switched their mission statements from and that, the purpose of this company is to be a really good chemicals company and chemicals matter for society, of course, to, um, and, uh, the, the, the mission of this company is to maximize shareholder value. You know? Now, whoever got up in the morning said, today I'm going to maximize shareholder value. No, but it's not a, it's not, it's not a proper motivation at all. Right? Um, but that produced a lot of institutions, firms, which were run ostensibly with this assumption that people in them were really lazy and selfish and would only behave properly if incentivized to do so. How did you incentivize to do so? Well, economics had come up with the principal agent theory that answered that one. You watch people like a hawk and you tie their monitored behavior to high powered incentives. Um, and so, and everything became built around the assumption that people could only be motivated by, uh, uh, basically carrots and sticks. Um, and that included the chief executive who, uh, was on a, uh, massive performance bonus, which of course, uh, is, uh, he managed to point his friends to the remuneration committee so that they gained that one. Um, but this meant that the institutions in which a lot of people worked were designed to lure people into behavior where, um, in order to earn a living, that's, that's how they're going to behave. Now we are a mammal. We got in us some of the instincts of my cat, but we're also this have evolved to be this very unusual mammal. A mammal who naturally wants to get the good opinion of others, cares about others, builds mutual uh, commitments. That's how we've succeeded as a, as a species. That's why we're, 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 we're above cats in the hierarchy of, uh, of, of, of living. Um, but the institutions that we're in can either drag us down towards catus economicus or lift us up towards uh, the, our better natures. And we have built over the last 40 years too many institutions designed to drag us down. Not only did a lot of firms do that, but then it the public sector decided it better imitate the strategies of firms. And so you've got this same wretched structure in the public sector of monitored incentives in, in, in activities where it was completely inappropriate. You know, some of the, some of the activities that are in the public sector, um, are highly ethically purposive. People doing things that 
just gives them a huge amount of intrinsic and uh, and pleasure, really, from from being able to do things for others. And you know, it expands that teaching. Hmm? I don't want to be on a teaching system where um, the the more my students praise when I do, the more money I get. I don't want to go into a class thinking, oh, uh, let's say that and I'll earn a bit more money. I want to go into a class and just try and educate uh, those kids. Hmm? Um, but that's not the structure we build. Well, I think, isn't the shareholder primacy movement uh, motivated in part by a, a, a realistic cynicism, which uh, economists share with critical theorists, that when a firm says that it's motivated by public interest, this is uh, just kind of uh, window dressing over what's really going on behind the scenes? I mean, similarly, you know, critics of the, the golden age you describe in the 50s and 60s would argue that this was built on on racism. It was built on um, on oppression of of ethnic minorities, of of uh, disenfranchised people on women. Uh, you know, isn't isn't it wouldn't that be the critique that this that, that by uh, having this this ideology, this this pervasive uh, illusion of, of collective mission, it kind of conceals a lot of the the power structure what's we really going we, on under the scenes this in america we different was the i think britain um the we was I mean, we didn't have the ratio in the 40s 50s we didn't have anything like this sort of racial and uh, uh, divisions so it was uh we didn't have the, the racial stuff we obviously had the the gender stuff um and so i'm not nostalgic for the past um we need to build as big a inclusive we as is possible. But the idea that the alternative to a we is just me, a set of individuals like a sack of potatoes, um, mm -hmm. that's not right. Um, the retreat from we into me doesn't produce a more caring society. It just produces a more selfish society. And, and and if there's no willing compliance with common purposes, uh, that is that the roads, that's a huge loss. Um, and let me challenge you on this business of um, the the the, the superstitious. Um, and 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 of course we're right to be cynical about uh, some aspects of especially current um, uh, behaviour of them. So. And my, uh, the story I enjoy most at the moment is, uh, is, is Goldman Sachs um, fighting the law case against the Arkansas uh, Teachers uh, Pension Fund. And you know, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's a, it's a live case at the moment where um, a Goldman Sachs mission statement says something about um, uh, our mission, it, it, our, our top priority is always the interest of our clients. So we serve the interest of our clients. That's our top priority. And the Arkansas you mean the Muppets? Teacher, sorry? You mean the Muppets? Yeah, yes, that's right. That's right. That's the Muppets. You're quite right. The Muppets. So that's the, that's the, the people they serve. Um, and the Arkansas Teachers Association is suing them on the grounds that whatever you were doing with us as the client, it clearly wasn't in our interest. Um, and Goldman Sachs defense is, um, is not, I mean, if you think about it, um, they could have had lots of defenses. They could have said, oh, well, it was in your interest. It just went wrong. We didn't, you know, it was a mistake. And all they could say, oh, it was, it was a rogue employee, that one. You know, he didn't understand the mission problem. But their defense is to say, of course we didn't need it. Of course we didn't mean, <laughs> and have you worked in your interest? Um, and that was just a puff. Um, uh, you knew it was a puff. Um, here's 30 examples where we uh, stuffed our clients, um, um, uh, and it became a public scandal, and it still didn't move the share price. So everybody knew that it was just a load of rubbish, what we would say. Now, that, um, that is true of some firms. 
And uh, it's not true of ours. And it certainly wasn't true. And um, let me give you an example of the, the, the company that, when I was a kid, was the most respected in Britain. It was called ICI, it was a chemical, chemical firm. Uh, and it was the dream of any bright young kid like me. My, if I'm good at science, maybe I could work for RCI, you know? And, and his mission statement was, um, we aim to be the best. First, it said, this is why the chemical industry is really important for society. And then it said, we aim to be the best chemical company in the world. And, you know, a young kid in science, you think, yeah, yeah, nah, that's worth doing. Yeah. And then in the early 90s, that mission statement literally got removed. And in its place, hey, our mission is to maximize shareholder value. Yeah. Now, I gave this talk um, and, uh, for, uh, for the... Uh, the, 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 the central bank of, of Pakistan a couple of years ago, it was a big public lecture and uh, the speaker's nightmare happened at the end where an old guy came up and said to me, I used to be a senior manager in ICI. And I thought, oh God. And, uh, so I was about to apologize saying, I, mean, I don't really know the details of ICI. <laughs> and then he held out hand to me and he said, I want to shake your hand because I lived through the destruction of a very fine company as all this bullshit came in and we were having to spend our time in seminars talking about how to maximize shell authority, how we could cut costs and stop doing the vital things that made the company a great company. Uh, and so, you know, it, ICI didn't just have a good line at all. There were thousands of people who lived their lives around that purpose. Of course, they want to earn a living as well. People are not saints. They don't work for nothing. I'm very suspicious of saints. They set the bar too high, saints and virtue signals. And I believe in recognizing that we are both a bit of catus economic consumers and um, have uh, had the better angels of our nature. And so we need uh, to work in environments where we're rewarded for effort, but where uh, we've given a benefit of trust so that we ourselves and, uh, can have uh, the agency um, to behave uh, using all our uh, contextual knowledge to take decisions. And that was what was denied by the um, monitored incentive structure. It was a structure in which the top, the chief executive knew best. He knew what was needed. And the problem was how to get these greedy, really, really selfish people uh, to obey his commands. So it was a command and control structure that we put in place when what we needed was a devolved structure of uh, individual agency to achieve common purpose by individual uh, and, uh, team efforts. Well, you talk about how both the family, the firm, and the nation can all serve as um, kind of arenas in which uh, this mutual obligation uh, and sense of belonging can, can be located. Um, but why, why not ethnicity or, um, you know, here in the United States, we, we are entering into what some people call a new era of, of tribalism where uh, these salient identities are, are being uh, emphasized um, that have to do with one's skin color or ancestry or so forth. Um, and um, why isn't why can't these be um, kind of venues for social obligation? And, and this may take us back to um, the discussion uh, in the emerging markets. In, in the book, in this book here, you you, you talk about how um, it's important to have a sense of of when there's an alignment between kind of ethnic and national um, 
uh, you know, boundaries that you're more likely yeah. to have a, a solid state. So, yeah. so what, what's, this may take us back to the discussion of the lawyers, because th it seems like this, this identity is built on, on a, a system of rights, uh, okay. so, rather than one of um, obligations. So here's the, here's the problem with, um, things like ethnicity as, 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 uh, as the entities of belonging. Um, and you're quite right. Um, uh, ethnic, ethnic groups can form um, communities within which there's a lot of mutuality, um, uh, but they are they're not porous identities, um, and so um, and, uh, as a as a white man, I can't uh, join the community uh, of, of of black men. Um, and uh, um, so it's not a porous identity, uh, just as a as black man, you can't join the community of white men. So if we're going to use as our core identities, black and white, um, we will be different groups. We can't build a common purpose across that ethnic divide. And yet, most surely, in all societies, that's what we need to do. Um, and that's the problem in a lot of poor societies uh, in Africa, that uh, because people have organized around uh, ethnic identities in multi-ethnic societies, um, it's very hard to build any common purpose at the level of the, of the state. Um, uh, but the, uh, but the, the, these, these societies have, have, have poor and small. And so the idea that you should fragment a country like Tanzania into 50 different tribal groups, each with its own little state, uh, is, is ludicrous. One of my great heroes, um, uh, Julius Nyerere, the first president, founding president of Tanzania, um, spent his entire first year, in fact, he stood down as head of government. He just spent his first year going around all the different tribal groups. He said, I'm not got a nation. I've got 50 tribes. And the first thing I've got to do is build a sense of, of shared identity. And then he did a few, a number of very practical things to try and build a sense of shared identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why Tanzania's basically stayed peaceful. And, uh, because he succeeded in building a sense of, of, of shared Tanzanian identity. Um, so that's the problem that is very easy for these um, non-porous boundaries to become oppositional identities, black versus white. Uh, and then we're seeing the world as a zero-sum game where there's no scope for collaboration. And yet there is huge scope for collaboration very few purposes where the sense of organization is racial. And most purposes, the sense of organization is some purpose that people have. Hmm? I, when I go to the, to my, uh, department and teach, um, I teach with a range of people of different ethnicities and we sit and meet and discuss together. How are we going to, you know, how are we going to conduct the teaching in, 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 in our department? I was very proud that when COVID struck, um, uh, until the entire university was closed down, and um, there was a, was a phase when we were, when we were permitted to teach, but with a lot of social distancing. And so our big classrooms weren't big enough, anything like big enough to teach everybody, but we all agreed. Let's do, let's teach four times our usual hours. So we've just been four times as much teaching. So all these students who've just arrived will get a proper Oxford experience of face-to-face -face contact in a class. Um, and that's what we did. We didn't, we, we didn't get paid any more for doing it. Um, we did it because we thought that's, that's, that's what our purpose in life as a teacher requires us to do now.
um, which it was. It was the right thing to do. And that's, the, you know, ethnicity came, didn't come, as it happens, most of my students are probably about 40 different shades of non-white, but, um, but it didn't, didn't come into it. The same with my, with my fellow teachers. It didn't matter. We had this common purpose. So, well, in what I think a lot of people um, fail to understand uh, when they take this economic view is when they see a weak state or a, a state that's that's failed to establish this national identity that's susceptible to what people call corruption. They 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 view it through the economic lens and they see it as individuals maximizing themselves. When in fact, much of it is really about. Um, obtaining resources for one's group or yeah. obtaining resources. It, it, so it, there's, it's, it's actually motivated by a, a loyalty or a group identity, Absolutely. which trumps the, the, yeah. that of the state. Um, yeah. Uh, people very seldom operate as individuals. They're, they're operating gangs. And, um, and that's what in the, in the weakest states, what we see is, is, is gangs and looting a common resource and, and fighting each other. Uh, and that is catastrophic for the society and tragic. It's an abuse of identity. It's identity that is destroying the whole, the society. And that's, and that's the danger we should all be guarding against. Of course, we should form in groups. We should form in groups around common purposes. And, and those groups should be porous enough that anyone who wants to join in that purpose could do so. I think you would argue that the, the saliency of these tribal identities in the West is, um, is harmful. And, and ironically, it's, it's, it's original motivation may come from John Rawls, which, you know, is, is I say ironic because John, John Rawls is certainly unobjectionable in terms of his uh, motivations. But, but you argue that through this rights based, lawyer approach, um, his, his ideal has been, um, distorted and skewed. Could you, could you talk a bit about that? Yeah. So this is the, um, uh, the, the abuse of the concept of human rights, um, uh, which has turned into two, two, two abuses. One is the, 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 the collapse of the concept of human rights into individual rights. And the other is the the degradation of human rights into the rights of groups. Um, whereas, um, to my mind, human rights really starts at the level of uh, the rights of people in a society. Um, and uh, in, in the poor and fragile societies where I spend a lot of my time, um, what is the big human right that's being abused? Um, it's not individual data protection or something. It's that millions of people are living in fear of hunger and in fear of violence. Um, and uh, the, the proper cause is to uh, help the society to climb out of that hunger and, uh, and, and violence. Um, and that's, that happens as people come together uh, across these gang divides into some common purposes. So, uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a, I, 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 I think rules has now been superseded by Sandel's very powerful concept of contributive justice. Rules was all about distributive justice. It was if there was a cake to be chopped up, whereas, uh, uh, Sandel's concept of contributive justice is that we all have agency and that agency is to be used so that we all contribute to cooking the cake. Now, in order to contribute to cooking the cake, we have to be empowered with the abilities um, and opportunities to do so. And so the agenda of contributive justice uh, has this sort of backstory of everybody needs to be prepared for a position where they have the skills and opportunities 
to contribute to society. And that's a big agenda, but I think it's a very much more noble agenda than fighting over how to shop the bloody cake up. Let's cook it. And in the poor societies I work on, um, fighting over a very, very tiny cake uh, really is a pitiful uh, activity. Mm -hmm. I think you spent most of your career trying to think about um, policies and interventions that uh, can be done to help the bottom billion. Um, and in this book, you turn to some policies that you think can help our own, um, uh, uh, the people within our own countries that are experiencing um, economic problems. Uh, and, and you have some provocative policy proposals, um, one of which involves uh, transferring wealth from the uh, metropolitan areas to those that are that are more remote. Um, maybe you could describe the how you you think about that, right? How you know, why is it that the metropolitan areas have become so so much wealthier and and so much more powerful and important than these cities like Sheffield, which were left behind? Uh, and and how would we remedy this? And why would we want to remedy this? Um, why, why can't we just let these cities empty themselves out and, you know, send them off to the ice flow and be done with them, right? Who needs Sheffield? Who needs Detroit? Why do we need these cities to come back? Why can't we just, one of the things that I found very interesting is that mobility in the United States, geographical mobility is at its lowest point in our entire history. So what happened in, in, in the 18th century is if, you know, if, if, uh, if a re if you used up all this, the nutrition in the soil, you just packed your, got on your horse and went somewhere else. And, and, you know, during the dust bowl in the thirties, there was a, you know, you couldn't farm in Oklahoma. So everybody just came to California. So why, why don't we just, why doesn't everybody just clear on out of Sheffield to clear on out of Glasgow, clear on out of, you know, Detroit and just move to greener pastures. That's an argument I think that some people make. Instead uh, of trying I, to rescue these areas. I, I'm astonished that when you say this is a controversial suggestion. Um, it's not a controversial suggestion in Britain. Um, there's been a recent survey of opinion from that it's, it's the one common purpose that almost everybody in Britain is agreed on, is the need to drastically narrow um, the, the, the spatial differences in opportunity. Um, and why is that so important? Because people naturally belong, not just to a group, but to a place. You know, a handful of people don't. They lit around from one place to another. Um, that's a very small minority. Um, yes, you know, in America, no matter where you go, you don't know where every, every place has McDonald's, every place has you know, Walmart, you, you, you know, in America, you never even know where you are. Maybe, maybe, you know, in, in England, it's, it's a bit different. You, you know, know where you are. You do know where you are. <laughs> and, 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 and I bet you do without any doubt, right? Um, people naturally bond to place. Um, uh, even though superficially, uh, places all look alike, um, uh, you don't have to scratch very far below the surface. To, to discover um, big differences and also big loyalties to those differences. People tend to love the place where they grew up um, and be, be attached to it. And so they want to stay. And it's not just the place, it's a whole network of their friends and relatives. That's why the people study put. We, are, we know that we care much, we get much more and, and uh, happiness from our relationships than from our consumption of material goods. And so uh, the thought of having, you know, that in order to get more material goods, I need to move away from all the relationships that need something to, that's a pretty stark thing to present people with. It might just about work if you're 18 and you're feeling a bit restless. Um, but, it, but even then, actually, it's a very cruel dilemma. It's a very cruel dilemma for parents. One of the things that's common in the north of England is that parents um, uh, of working-class kids 
don't even want their children to get a good education because if they've got a good education, there aren't any opportunities to use that good education in their hometown. And so a good education for their kids would just be an environment in which then they had to say bye-bye. And, and so indeed it would present there, there are two possible outcomes. If you put your bets on education in a, in a very poor town, um, one is that your kid tries but fails and your then your kid feels terrible because he's competing with kids with much better opportunities elsewhere. And the other is he, he, he tries to succeed like I did. And then he says, bye, mum and dad. You know? And that's their tragedy. Um, well, I think what was novel about the proposal was that it wasn't simply about uh, taxing wealthy and transferring, as, transferring uh, money to uh, the less wealthy. It was really sp- geographical. It was, it was yeah. specifically okay. around... So- yeah, so there's yeah. two concepts that, that are linked together. One is that what you're worried, why is it ethically right? It's not just a transfer from rich people to poor people. It's a transfer to people who actually, just actually, um, should have a share in, um, the, pro- in the, the high productivity of the metropolitan skill. Why? Because the metropolitan skills are not productive, super productive because of their individual abilities, which is what they think. They are very productive because they're all clustered together in an environment where there is a uh, big government, um, big finance, um, big infrastructure, big airports. They're in the heart of a web of connectivity in Britain. London, every damn thing that happens in London, the, all government decisions are taken in London, all financial decisions are taken in London, both the international airports are in London, the link across the channel is in London, and uh, all the rail hubs go to London, and all the motorways go to London. So, and who paid for all that? We all did. Who created the legal system um, uh, which supports the courts in London? We all did that. That was the struggle for democracy. We all, our ancestors, we all did that. And so we are all entitled to a share of those, what is called in economics, rents of agglomeration. Uh, And instead, those rents of agglomeration are being captured by two groups. One is the people who own land and high, and property in the metro- metropolis, and the other is people with a lot of skills um, who just uh, live in bed sits in the metropolis, so they don't have to pay much in the way of rent, but they earn these big salaries, and they can drive around in their Porsches and Maseratis, or whatever the equivalent is in America, um, uh, because they're capturing very big returns which should rightfully belong to everybody. And so that's the basis for why they don't deserve it. But then what we need to spend it on, not just transfers of consumption. What people in poor places want is not just consumption. They want the dignity of the opportunities to be productive. And for that, We need to transfer not just money, but the opportunities for productivity. And that is good jobs and skills. And that is the agenda that actually levels up a country spatially. It's the transfer of big bucks to people who deserve it from people who have captured it. And it's the investment in economic opportunities in a place those opportunities having disappeared through acts of public policy, such as uh, encouraging technological change that costs jobs and and opening trade that costs jobs. Those things are potentially good things, but they're only good things um, if the people who win are required to compensate properly 
the people who lose so that nobody loses. Uh, and, well, this takes you back full circle t to your to your original work, which is, you know, which is, uh, you, you know, monetary transfers just by themselves are, are probably not going to do the trick, right? Um, you no. know, you're, all you're doing is creating a honeypot that everyone's going to fight over and, um, and now that local authorities no longer need to concern themselves with, with the interests of their constituents, um, you know, how, how can you utilize the insights that you've learned from the failures of development policy uh, to design a, um, a workable uh, policy for these, these poor um, areas within our developed economies? Yes, exactly. Exactly. That is, that is, that is the, um, and the, the, again, the key insight there is that there are, there are multiple equilibria, um, uh, and, um, uh, a good image for a multiple equilibria is, is a, is a sailing dinghy. I don't know if you've ever been on a sailing dinghy, but it, so sailing dinghy has two equilibria, um, local equilibria, right way up is locally stable. Upside down is locally stable. In fact, upside down is even more locally stable than right way up. When you learn how to say that sailing dinghy, you spend a lot of your time trying to turn an upside down dinghy back upright. And then, and, um, a lot of the societies that I work on in poor countries are analogous to upside down dinghies. And um, we know that these societies could be structured in a way that produced a much higher level of productivity and so a much higher level of income. What they need is firms, skills, and, and they need to turn the dinghy upright. And of course they need ideas in people's heads that produce a lot of within compliance with common purposes rather than the gang warfare that they've got. And the same is true and in poor regions of our countries. They aren't upside down sailing beacons, which are locally stable. They're, they're the deaths of despair. People are despondent and so that the talented young people leave and firms don't go there because they look to be a talent desert. Um, you don't get any of the support services that small firms need in order to grow into big firms. Um, and so, so uh, trying to turn those uh, upside down diggies the right way up requires a coordinated effort and a, and a new, if you like, a new narrative, a hopeful but convincing narrative of a, of a good future instead of a bad future. At the moment, these depressed places are trapped into uh, a common narrative of failure and doom. And that is a self-fulfilling um, position. It's, it's the concept in economics of the ergodic. The, 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 the beliefs that people hold produce outcomes which, um, which appear to validate the beliefs. So if you believe a place is doomed and you're doomed, your behavior and the behavior of other people looking at the society aggregates into behavior, which takes you back, uh, into confirming the beliefs. Um, so we have to have some kind of conditional, conditional aid. I mean, you know, we, here in, in San Francisco, we have, we spend $55,000 per homeless person, which just means that we have more homeless people and, yep. and we have cities like Washington DC uh, that spend more on, on, uh, per, per pupil than, you know, Prince in New Jersey and, and yet no one, you know, the, the literacy rates are very low. How, how do we, um, if we're going to infuse, uh, money into, um, sort of some of the failing areas, how do we make sure that that money is, is well spent? Okay. So first of all, um, this is not something we can do to them. It's something they have to forge as their own strategy, but they need resources to do it. Um, and, uh, and some, some of them won't use it very well. Um, the, the best strategy I think is to, is to, to give resources, first of all, try and help places to come together around some sort of forward looking common strategy that has to happen. It won't happen everywhere, but where it happens and where that 
forward-looking strategy is not manifestly stupid, it's worth supporting. And, uh, and not conditionally, not saying you've got to do this, you've got to do that, but it's worth supporting. Um, and then some of these will succeed, some of them won't. But the ones that succeed will be, wow, we didn't expect that place to recover, but it has. And then it will, it will get copied. That, according to a wonderful book by Heinrich, is the secret of our success as a species. We're very good at copying success. Now, think how East Asia developed. 40 years ago, four little places got decisively ahead of the pack. South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, and Taiwan. They were piddling little places compared to the, the big giants of, 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 of Asia. But that success got copied in the community of Asian countries. And pretty rapidly, it spread to virtually everywhere. And that is the process that we need to ignite in Africa. There are a few countries that, and they have to own their own strategy. That can't be something that we do to them. We can do with them, but it has to be their strategy that they own. If only if they own it, will they implement it. Only if they design it themselves, right? And, and, and we have it, and we need exactly the same thing in our, um, in our broken towns and cities in America and Britain. Of course, Pittsburgh is an example of that. It used to be a broken city. It's now, I think, one of the top 12 cities in America. And I know the mayor who actually was instrumental in turning Pittsburgh around. Um, and uh, that was a, a fantastic achievement by Pittsburgh. You know, he, 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 he was able to um, uh, lure some people growing up in Pittsburgh back to come to Pittsburgh and help. They were successful people who wanted to restore Pittsburgh. They had fond memories for it, and they did. Um, and they worked together uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a strategy of revival. Of course, the, the universities played a big role. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the local firms played a big role and the, and the, and the, and the city's, um, administration played a big role and the, and the state. So it was, it, there you have this network of common purpose, um, around very different entities, which all had a role to play. The universities were generating the ideas, um, uh, Lower and of training the skilled people, um, uh, the venture capitalists were bringing in finance, and the local entrepreneurs were picking up the ideas generated by the universities, getting the financial support of venture capital, and then some of those firms, a minority, grew to become major firms, and they became the major employers, creating opportunity. So where, where, you know, success is entirely possible and uh, turnarounds are entirely possible. Um, uh, but where we're in places such as my own, uh, country of, of England, where no region outside London has been successful. There's no English city, which is above the national average productivity, except for London, mm. everywhere is below the national average productivity because London's so much more productive. Yeah. And that's the situation where at the moment we don't have any successes to emulate. And so we need to create some. And that's got to be by experiment. Some will work, some won't. The ones that work will become the equivalent of the Taiwans, the Singapore's that get copied. Yeah, that's remarkable. England is really more like a, a developing country in that respect, uh, it is, Latin American or African yeah, country. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, parts of America could do with uh, uh, success that they, 
that they emulate. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's, there's, there are too many flyover cities in America, and that whole term of disgrace is sick about it. Yes, indeed. Well, this has been a great um, conversation, and uh, we did barely even scratch the surface of your um, your original work. This this stuff, which is I'm a big fan of this work for many many years, um, and there's so much that we could talk about, um, you know, with respect to your work in Africa, which has consumed most of your life. Um, but this this book also is is very interesting. The future of of capitalism. Check it out, Paul. You have a new book out with John Kay. That's right. Indeed, it's, but it's not come out in America. It's called Greed is Dead. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's basically a, a thesis that uh, our societies at the moment have hit peak greed um, and that uh, the intellectual underpinnings of the case that greed is other than loathsome, those intellectual underpinnings have now been destroyed. Uh, They are no longer intellectually respectable. And so uh, gradually as those ideas filter through, we can recede from peak greed to a more community society. So it's a prediction of a happier future. Um, Well, nice to read a book that predicts a happier future at the moment. Well, I look forward to reading that book and, and continuing the conversation. Thank you, Paul, for joining me. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 